Hey everyone, and welcome to 15 Minute Discourse. Today, we are going to be taking a deep dive into plasmoids. That's fun. Now, a plasmoid is basically a self contained structure of plasma held together by its own magnetic field. It's kind of like a little blob of lightning. Yeah, exactly. And we're going to be looking at some research papers, historical accounts, even some potential connections to unexplained phenomena. Very cool. First up, let's talk about how these plasmoids are created. One method that stood out to me was the research from Los Alamos National Laboratory, where they actually use these plasma guns. Oh, yeah, those are awesome. Yeah, they use plasma guns to fire this ionized material across a magnetic field. And the strength of that magnetic field is really important. It is. It is. They used fields around 4,000 gas, I believe. Wow. Yeah. And they found that the experimental setup also played a big role. Like when they used four different plasma sources, they created these ring-shaped plasmoids. Ring-shaped plasmoids. Now that is a visual. It is. It is very cool stuff. And those rings can maintain their shape for a surprisingly long time, too. Oh, wow. How long are we talking about here? At least 30 seconds, which is way longer than you'd expect. Really? 30 seconds? Yeah. It's pretty wild. And get this, they observed these rings seemingly seeking each other out and attaching themselves together like little plasma buddies. So they are like forming these little plasma friendships. That's pretty amazing. I know, right? And the structures they created were even more incredible, almost like barred spirals. Barred spirals. Now that's getting pretty complex for like a, a blob of lightning. I know, right? It makes you wonder just how complex these formations can get. Okay, so we got these rings and sometimes they make little plasma friends. They form these barred spirals. But what about other shapes? The research mentioned something called S-plasmoids. Yeah, so S-plasmoids are a specific type of plasmoid known for their instability. When they're in free space, without any external magnetic fields, they have a tendency to expand and become oblong, kind of like a stretched out circle. So they are a little bit more unpredictable. A little bit, yeah. Is there any way to like stabilize them or contain them? Researchers are looking into using external DC magnetic fields to try and stabilize them. Okay, so like a magnetic fence to keep them in line? Exactly. It's like building a little magnetic corral for them. But uh, it's still an area of active research, so there's a lot we don't know about how to control their behavior. So it's like trying to wrangle a tiny lightning storm. It kind of is. Speaking of containment, we were talking about those ring-shaped plasmoids and how they are stable. So they don't randomly turn into a figure eight or do something crazy like that. No, they generally hold their shape quite well. But here's something really cool. When they used eight plasma sources to create these rings, they observed the rings moving along the magnetic field lines, almost like they were traveling along a designated path. So it was like a plasma highway. Yeah, exactly. It's like they are on a magnetic roller coaster. And it gets even cooler if you look at the stereo photographs taken with a 20 degree separation. You can see that the plasma material inside these rings is actually twisting, kind of like a DNA helix. Oh, so not only are they traveling along these magnetic highways, but they are like doing a little dance as they go. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. It just shows how even within something as chaotic as plasma, there are these intricate structures and forces at play. That is just mind-blowing. Now, all this talk about plasmoids is making me think about ball lightning. Mm -hmm. I've always been fascinated by that. Is there any connection to plasmoid research? Oh, definitely. Actually, one of the big questions surrounding ball lightning is understanding its energy source. Some reports suggest that it can contain energy levels upwards of 10 to the 6th joules, which is a massive amount of energy, much more than you would get from simply ionizing the equivalent volume of air. So what is fueling this incredible amount of energy? That is the big question. And theoretical models based solely on ionized gas really struggle to account for this high energy. The recombination process happens way too fast. So there's got to be something else going on there. Right. And to really grasp it, we might need to consider a continuous input of energy. One model that stands out is Kapitza's model. OK, I am all ears. What is that all about? Kapitza proposed that the ball lightning is sustained by intense electromagnetic radiation that's constantly supplying energy. So instead of a one-time energy burst, it's more like a constant wireless power supply. Exactly. And this model addresses that energy discrepancy really well. That is fascinating. So it is not just a static thing. It's dynamic. It's constantly being fueled. Yeah, it's really quite remarkable. Well, that sets the stage perfectly to talk about what we can observe about ball lightning. We have all these eyewitness accounts, but what have we really learned from them? Well, the reports are incredibly varied. 
People describe all sorts of sizes, brightness levels, and durations. But one interesting correlation that emerges is that larger ball lightning tends to be reported as less bright. Oh, really? That is interesting. It seems counterintuitive, but the bigger it is, the dimmer it appears to be. That is fascinating. What about the duration? Is there a link between the brightness and how long it lasts? That's a bit trickier. We haven't found any statistically significant correlations there. So the relationship between brightness and duration seems to be more complex than we initially thought. So size matters, but duration is a bit of an enigma. And what about the distance from which people observe these events? Does that play a role in how frequently ball lightning is reported? That's a good point. It's possible that it's easier to spot ball lightning from a distance if it's occurring over wide areas or within a large volume of the atmosphere then you're more likely to catch a glimpse of it from further away that makes sense but wouldn't it be harder to see if you're farther away especially if it's not very bright you would think so but we also have to consider the factor of noticeability not every ball lightning event is going to be recognized as such it could yeah. be mistaken for something else or simply go unnoticed entirely oh yeah that's true so okay. there is probably a lot of underreporting going on. We might only be seeing the tip of the iceberg. It's very likely. Now, how does this ball lightning actually move? That's a great question. Yeah, is it just drifting with the wind, or is there something more to it? Well, a good number of reports actually describe ball lightning moving independently of the wind. Oh, really? Which suggests it might have some internal mechanism for propulsion. So it's not just passively floating around. Right. It seems to have a sense of direction. That is strange. And some reports even describe ball lightning seemingly following objects or structures, like power lines. Following power lines? Yeah. It's as if it's attracted to them or needs to feed off their energy. That is so weird. And mm. speaking of different behaviors, it seems like there might actually be different types of ball lightning. There might be. Based on the patterns we've seen, we've identified two primary groups. One appears after a lightning strike hits the ground. So they are like born from a bolt of lightning. Yeah. And the other one just appears seemingly out of thin air. Wow. So spontaneous ball lightning. Are there any other differences between these two types? Well, they seem to have different ways of disappearing. The ones originating from a ground strike tend to end quietly on or near the ground, while the ones appearing in midair often end with a bang. Like an explosion. Yeah. It suggests that there might be different mechanisms at play in how they form and dissipate. Wow. That is incredible. It feels like we've only just scratched the surface of this plasmoid world. We have. There is so much more to explore. Oh, yeah, yeah. Tons to learn. Tons to explore. It's like solving one mystery and then it just opens up like 10 more. So why should we care about plasmoids? What is like the big picture here? Are there practical applications or is it just about satisfying our scientific curiosity? Well, it's a bit of both, but it's definitely not just some abstract pursuit. Scientists are exploring some pretty mind-blowing potential applications for these things. Like what? Well, one of the most exciting possibilities is in the field of fusion energy. Fusion energy, are we talking like harnessing the power of the sun here? Yeah, pretty much. Fusion energy is often seen as like the holy grail of clean energy and plasmoids might be the key. Wow, the key to clean energy. Yeah, because they can contain that superheated plasma, which is what we need for fusion reactors. So a world powered by like little tiny stars, that would be amazing. It would be pretty incredible. A clean, safe, limitless energy source. Yeah. I guess that is still a ways off, right? Yeah, probably. But there are some more immediate applications being explored, too. Oh, really? Like spacecraft propulsion. So plasmoid-powered rockets. Are we going to be zipping around the galaxy in these plasma-fueled spaceships? It might sound like science fiction, but it's a real area of research. The idea is to use magnetic fields to accelerate these plasmoids, create thrust for spacecraft. Wow, that would be incredible. Reaching incredible speeds, exploring distant planets, maybe even venturing out to other star systems. That would be amazing. It's pretty exciting stuff. Okay, so we have clean energy, space travel, but let's bring it back down to Earth for a minute. Remember we talked about those unexplained phenomena? Uh-huh. Well, I am thinking about those UFO sightings that have puzzled people for so long. Mm -hmm. Could some of those be misidentified plasmoids? It's definitely possible. Plasmoids can take on so many different shapes, sizes, colors, and they can move pretty quickly and erratically, too. They can even emit light and sound. So if you don't know what a plasmoid is, it is easy to see how someone might mistake it for something extraordinary, especially if they're seeing it in the sky at night. Yeah, I can imagine that, like, a glowing orb of plasma 
just zipping around in the dark mm -hmm. would be pretty startling. And I mean, considering how much we still don't know about plasmoids, it is also possible that some of these sightings could be natural phenomena that we have yet to fully explain or even identify. Oh, absolutely. There is still so much out there that we don't understand. That's what makes it so exciting. The universe is full of mysteries, even right here on our own planet. Yeah, there is always something new to discover. Speaking of new discoveries, what's the latest on the research front? What are scientists focusing on right now in this quest to understand plasmoids? One of the big challenges is figuring out how to make them more stable. Oh, yeah. They can be a little unpredictable. Yeah. So if we want to harness their power, whether it's fusion energy or space travel, we need to be able to control them. Right, right. So how are they doing that? They are trying all sorts of things. They are running experiments, using computer simulations, trying to figure out what factors contribute to stability, like the shape of the magnetic fields, the density and temperature of the plasma. It's a lot of trial and error, but they are making progress. So they are basically looking for the perfect recipe to make a stable plasmoid. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. And they've had some success using external magnetic fields to create these magnetic cages that keep the plasmoid contained. Like a plasma force field. That is cool. What about creating plasmoids? I know we talked about those plasma guns, but are there any other ways to make them? Oh yeah, scientists are getting pretty creative. They are experimenting with lasers, microwaves, even focused sound waves to generate plasmas and shape them. Focused sound waves, are you serious? <laughs> That's amazing. Sculpting lightning with sound? I know, right? It's pretty wild. And all these new techniques could lead to more precise, more controllable plasmoids in the future. So from plasma cannons to plasma paintbrushes, it's pretty amazing. Now, what about naturally occurring plasmoids? We talked about ball lightning, but are there other plasmoid phenomena out there that scientists are studying? Oh, definitely. One area that's really fascinating is the study of plasmoids in space. Space plasmoids? Yeah, space plasmoids. That's awesome. Where do they hang out? What are they doing out there in the cosmos? Well, they're pretty much everywhere. In the sun's atmosphere, around planets, in nebulae. Wow even just floating around in interstellar space. They're like these little cosmic building blocks playing a role in all sorts of amazing events like solar flares, the auroras we see here on Earth, oh. even the formation of stars and galaxies. So plasmoids are kind of like the unsung heroes of the universe. Yeah, they are. And by studying them, we can unlock so many secrets about the universe, its history, its evolution. It's like having this cosmic Rosetta Stone. Now, what about the search for extraterrestrial life? Could plasmoids play a role in that as well? Well, some scientists believe they could. We talked about the possibility of plasmoid-based life forms, but there's also the idea that plasmoids could be a sign of alien technology. Alien technology. Now you're talking my language. How so? We know we can create plasmoids artificially here on Earth, and some have speculated that advanced alien civilizations could be using them for all sorts of things, you know, generating energy, powering their spacecraft, even communicating across vast distances. Communicating? Yeah. Wow, so if we see some strange plasmoid activity out there, it could be a sign that ET is trying to call us. Well, maybe. It's definitely a possibility. But, you know, we always have to be careful not to jump to conclusions. There could be other explanations, natural phenomena that cause this unusual activity. But it's definitely something worth investigating further. Right, right. Yeah. We have to keep an open mind. And it's a good reminder that the search for extraterrestrial life shouldn't just be focused on finding biological organisms like ourselves. We need to be open to all sorts of possibilities life forms that might be completely different from anything we have ever imagined. It's true. The universe is a vast and mysterious place. It is. It is. Full of surprises. Well, I think we have reached the end of our deep dive into the incredible world of plasmoids. It has been a fascinating journey. It really has. We have covered so much ground, the basic science of these things, their potential to revolutionize energy and space travel, the mind-boggling philosophical implications, and, of course, their role as cosmic building blocks. It's really amazing stuff. It is. And it's just the beginning. There's so much more to learn and explore. Absolutely. And to all our listeners out there, if you are as captivated by plasmoids as we are, we encourage you to keep exploring, keep asking questions, and keep your minds open to the wonders of the universe. There's so much more to discover out there. There is. And if you've enjoyed today's deep dive, be sure to subscribe to our podcast for more adventures into the fascinating world of science and technology. We have many more incredible discoveries to share with you. Until next time, keep those minds curious, those imaginations firing. And remember to like and subscribe. We'll catch you on our next deep dive.